I have a girlfriend like that. <laughs> I like people that are always ready. All right, we're rolling. Okay. I'm Pittsburgh Pat. I'm here with Pete Geisler, who you might recognize from our previous video where we talked about his uh, book about uh, uh, the, the man who invented the Ferris wheel, who actually lived in Pittsburgh for a while. He's an author, teacher, and publisher. And today we're going to talk about the publisher part, and he's going to teach us how you get published, right? Yeah. That's so good. how do you do that? Uh, well, you know, with a great deal of effort. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the first thing. Uh, uh, everybody has a book in their head, supposedly, right? Everybody. I, I've heard that. Head. Yeah, yeah, everybody. It's, it's an old cliche from many, 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 many years ago. And, but the problem is a book in your head is easy. A book out of your head and into a manuscript and then a then a real book that people can hold in their hands and read or hold on their kindle now and read you know that's the hard part right and that, and that but it's not really the hardest part of publishing you know the hardest part comes after you get the blasted thing done it's finished and then you have to market it mm. market is probably 60 percent of the effort some people say that how do, you, how do you get it out into the public's mind? Yeah. It, it all, it's a process that goes from your mind to the reader's mind. My mind. And there's about, well, you don't have a mind. <laughs> it's like a Vulcan mind meld, almost. It's a what? Uh, you remember Star Trek with a Vulcan mind meld? He's like, mind meld, yeah. Okay, it's kind it's of the like. same thing. Yeah. Well, the, the, the number of steps that's required from my mind to your mind, you know, it just, it, it could take a lot, a lot few, but you know, can, there are some conventional steps and now some non-conventional steps. You know, the publishing business has changed a great deal in the past 10 years. Well, great, I mean, the thing that I've known about anything that I find that's really difficult is that if I break it down into steps, then it's not as difficult because I can concentrate on one step at a time and I can break those down a little bit too and find help with the ones that I don't understand or I need help with. So. So like, what's the first step? I mean, obviously the first step is to write the novel. Let's assume that we've written the novel and we have a manuscript. What do we do after that? Well. Or is there something I need to know while I'm writing the novel to make it more easy to publish maybe? Yes, you know, first of all, if you have an idea, the first thing to do is check it out. Now we check it out on Google. We used to have to run to the library and see how many other people have written on the same subject. Okay. And then you have to start thinking, brainstorming with yourself about how your take on that subject is different and how the reading public might want to read it because it is different. You can say the same thing, but better and might get some readers. But if you say a similar thing or similar idea and it's got something added to it, uh, you have a much better idea. Let me give you an example. Just this yesterday, actually, please. A, a person sent me a book and said, I, he was very adamant about it. He said, and very enthused about his book. And he said, uh, I think everybody in the world ought to read this. Well, I, I read it. You know, it's a very short book. And I, I said to myself, and then I eventually said to him, we've covered this subject in probably hundreds of books mm. and how is this different? And so I wrote him a little critique and, and said, do some research and tell me how this one is different from this book and that book and that book and that book. So why should, why should a reader be interested in it if it's the same stuff as I read five years ago or 25 years ago? Gotcha. So anyway, then you take it out of your mind if we say yes, by the way, I did that as the acquisition editor for the Expressive Press. Okay. I have, yeah. I have many hats. Where are my hats? <laughs> I'm wearing them for you. I'm, so, an, I'm an actual acquisition editor for the so Express. As an acquisition editor, you would read a manuscript and then and then say and initially say, look, here's a way to like further your idea here, to make this more marketable, make this more saleable. Yes, exactly. Well, I sent that one. I sent that one, as they say, back to the drawing board. I haven't heard from the guy yet. I only did it this morning. <laughs> gotcha. So, uh, 
you know, he'll be back to me in the next day or two. And one of the reasons he'll be back to me, he's, I think he's making the mistake of being in love with his manuscript. Yes. And you can't do that, as you know. Yes. You, you, in love with it. you have to allow people to critique it. And, you know, I always say this, if I give somebody something to read, I rarely, I mean, my fam, I'll give it to my family. They can read it. I'm, they're not going to critique me though. They're going to say, oh, good job. You, you, <laughs> yeah. that. You, yeah. you were a writer. That's great. But that doesn't, that's good for my ego, but that doesn't help the writing, you know? I need, yeah. I need somebody to tell me where it fails. I need somebody to tell me the weak points. I need to strengthen it. So tell me the protagonist doesn't sound like he would say that in this particular instance. That's helpful critique. That's helpful critique, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you need that. You I have a, a, a series of four reviewers that I use for many of my books. Mm. And uh, I expect them to be honest mm -hmm. and they, they are, as the cliche goes, uh, sometimes they are brutally honest. I wouldn't mind that. I, a brutal is okay because there are brutal readers out there. And if you can satisfy them, then, you're, then you know your fiction or, well, I write fiction mostly, but you know that your writing is, is, is stronger. You know? Yes, yes. Well, uh, after you get this idea out of your head mm -hmm. and everybody says, okay, it's a great idea. You write the you write the manuscript comes out in eight by ten pieces of paper right and it's usually written in something like Word or one of the latest ones I don't know. No Google documents they have a lot of they have writing software. In there. There's a there's a all kinds of doc of of, of uh, perform for programs that you know you can use to write your write your book, mm -hmm. okay? and you have to break it into into chapters and then then you have to figure out. What is the say? What are the salient selling points of the book? Mm. So you have to write a cover letter, and you have to write a cover letter and a proposal to a to a a, a publisher. Okay. The cover letter has to be a very succinct one page, three paragraphs, let's say, really really tight synopsis of the points that you're trying to try to tell your readership and why the readership will be interested. Okay. In other words, every publisher today wants to know if they can make money on your book. Right. So you have to tell them, here's why your readers will, will want to read this book. And so I got to go back on like, huh, Go ahead. Oh, so is this like a sales pitch? Like, like say, you know, like the classic scene where you walk into a Hollywood director and you say, Oh, our movie is E.T. meets the Princess Bride, you know, and, and, you know, you try to like give them a 10 second like blurb and then maybe a couple paragraphs. Out, well, this is in written form, so you can do a couple paragraphs after that, but you want it to be like a one page cover sheet, like one sheet. One sheet. Okay. Wow. That's that's got to be difficult for a lot of writers, I think. I my most popular writer on the Expressive Press, when I asked him to do that, he couldn't. Mm. He literally couldn't, but but his book is was so well done, you know that we let it slide, and now it's our bestseller. <laughs> so, How about that? Oh, so there's an okay. exception to every rule, but but you want to be able to do this. You want to be able to do that, and then you and then what you need to do is what do what they call a proposal, and a proposal talks about you know a set series of. And it's much longer than the cover letter, by the way. It, it gives you the title. You, you have to have a catchy title. You have to have a catchy subtitle most of the time. Yes. You have to have a synopsis of the book that goes into the back cover, what the book is about. And then you get into the hard stuff. Who will read it? Give me a profile of the readership. So your target audience, persons? maybe. Huh, what's that? So like your target audience. Well, that's your target like, audience. Okay, this this is going to appeal to twenty to thirty year old men, or yes. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My books, for example, don't appeal to to twenty three year old women. They, they appeal to businessmen usually. Understood. Usually in the thirty to fifty range. Gotcha. The Ferris book though uh, appeals to a much broader audience. That would be a wider appeal. Yeah. Appeal, yeah. 
I could see that. Then you have to go, there's another section in your proposal, who's the competition? What uh -huh. book for the competition? And who wrote the competition? It's important. Let's say you're writing a legal mystery. Your competition is John Grisham. Right. He wrote a similar book. You were kind of kind of deep shit on that one. Okay. You, yeah. you, you compete with somebody like John Grisham. You know, not gonna fly. Not gonna fly too well, though. But also, you don't want to do do so do things like compete against the Bible. <laughs> that might be a little <laughs> difficult as well. So um, I'm not writing a new religion, is what you're saying. Okay. Not writing a new religion. Oh, all right. Well, there goes that idea. <laughs> so, therefore, you've got the you got the target audience, the competition to get the target audience's interest, <coughs> and then you've got to write a chapter by chapter synopsis of the book. Oh wow! Yeah. So like a heavy Maybe. outline. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a detailed outline. You, know, you have a title, a subtitle, and maybe four or five lines of this is what it's about. I see. Well, you know, it's really interesting because I write from an outline. So um, when I write, I almost always write from an outline. And so if as a writer, save that outline, you know, that that's going to help you later with your business proposal. Yeah, it'll help you it'll help you a great deal. Very nice. Very. Um, you're on. I think you're unusual, Pat. In that you write from an outline, mm. uh, I uh, I always recommend to my students, especially up at the university, said uh, you don't have to write from an outline anymore, especially on a big paper like twenty page or like a twenty page report or an essay, fifty pages, something like that. Mm -hmm. The way word processing is set up, and everybody I think is listening to us knows this. You can start in the middle of the book mm -hmm. and, and branch out in either direction. Matter of fact, you might have you might start in the middle of let's say you might label it chapter it chapter six, and at the end of the book it turns out and when you're done writing it maybe chapter twelve. I see. So, but that's word processing has allowed us to do that. When we had when we had to type on paper and then carbon paper and you know that was a little bit more difficult. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, I've never. Very rarely. I mean, in my college days, I did use an old Underwood typewriter to write some papers, but, but that I very soon after I had a fiction writing professor who said, invest in a word processor. And that's what they were back then. Uh, PCs were just starting to become popular. So I kind of dating myself there, but the, um, but when I mean, I write from an outline, one of the reasons I do use an outline is so I can do that. So if I wake up and I say, Oh my gosh, I have a great idea for chapter six. I'm going to write that today so that I don't have to feel like I'm obligated to write through from beginning to end so that, and I will write through at the end because you have to make, you know, consistency. You have to, I don't know, I find it useful, but the, um, but yeah, so I can jump around on my outline and just say like, um, you know, this is what I want to write about today or what I feel like I'm inspired to write about today. And of course, you know, uh, yeah, the outline is also flexible. At yeah. that phase in life, like very good, probably not set in stone. Okay. And I do that too, Pat. I wake up in the middle of the night and I get this idea. Yeah. So I so I my I'm sleeping on the third floor and writing on the second. So I jump out of bed and turn the lights on and and, and, and I at least get the idea into the manuscript somehow yeah. or into the outline somehow. Yeah. So that I don't lose it. Yeah, well, that's the problem. If you wait till morning, it's gone sometimes and oh, you're you can't do that. It back and 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 uh, yeah, I you know Tara, my significant other, she'll she'll often complain. Well, not complain. But she'll often note. Let's say she'll note that she heard. I heard typing at three thirty last night. Yeah, you heard typing at three thirty. That was me. <laughs> well, the, the other thing I do, and have done for many, probably probably thirty to fifty years, I have a, a tape recorder or a recorder sitting next to my bed. Yeah. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I have an idea. Plink. You know, I, I, I talk into that tape tape recorder. Yeah. I never yeah. write it because the next day I can't figure out what I, what I wrote. Oh, because it's How, so legible. It looks yeah. like scribbles. Yeah, that's that. This uh, this has a voice recorder. Almost all of them do. Sometimes you have to download it, actually. Uh, sometimes it's not pre-installed in the in the software. But one of my most popular videos on this channel, actually, is is about how to use your voice recorder. And uh, yeah, it comes in handy because 
most people have this on their person on almost all times. So, you know, you can be in an elevator, you can be, you know, in the shopping mall parking lot and just, you know, something comes up, put it down, put it, put it down, you know? Don't well, I've gotten my best ideas, I think, in, either in the shower or walking the dog. It's always somewhere where it's inconvenient, where you're not around a pen or a piece well, of paper. You carry that thing with you all the time. Yeah. When, you, when you're writing a book. Yeah. You always go back and forth. You know, I, I'm, I'm finishing a book right now. It's 25 or 7,000 words right now. Wow. And um, all of a sudden I had an idea. I think this famous professor from the University of Pennsylvania wrote something about this. Wow. And I want to hear his thoughts. Okay. So this morning, I got up about four o'clock this morning. Okay. Grabbed that book off the shelf. And I got to tell you, he gave me some great ideas like putting in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography in the book, you know, that kind of thing. Nice. So he gave me some great ideas. So I, I grabbed his, I borrowed his ideas, but I put his ideas into my own words so that I'm not plagiarizing. Sure. That's important though. You, that's an important thing to note. I, I think some people have a, a maybe an, a blurred concept of what plagiarism is. So from a legal standpoint, as a publisher, tell me what plagiarism is. Like, can you tell me, I, I mean, I think I know what the definition is, but, but, you know, if I, if, if somebody's out there right now as a writer, if they're okay, are they, can they quote, if they quote something from another work, how do they do that? Okay. You can, you can quote other people without, without, uh, no, without notification, without crediting, up to I think it's now three or four lines. Three or four lines. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, I'm not too sure. Those rules change all the time. Okay. Uh, the other thing to do is when you when you give him, let's say, a whole paragraph, you have to say, you know, taken from X Y Z book by A B C, uh, and, and give him total total affirmation for that. So, okay. Okay. So if you attribute, you can, you can quote, as long as it's in quotes, you, and you give an attribution to whoever the, whomever the source is, you can use that in the body of your text. Yes, you can. Okay. So in I can see. I'm writing now. I've done that, I don't know, three or four times now. Right. So, so if, for an example, so if, if I say um, something like, um, uh, Elon, uh, if I say something like uh, uh, te Tesla is not going to take e uh, Bitcoin any longer, that's something that Elon Musk said this morning on the news, I guess. So I don't have to attribute that to Elon Musk. But if I say, if I use his words and I say something like, uh, we are announcing that the, the company Tesla Incorporated will no longer be accepting payments for our new model cars, blah, 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 blah with the uh, cryptocurrency. In quotation marks, Elon Musk, 13 May 2021 release, you know, news release, uh, something like that. Okay, gotcha. You have to put that attribution either in the text right where it is, or put it as a you know a, a superscript and then a footnote, or right. a superscript and an endnote. Right. So if you're writing like a scholarly work, you can have a, a, a notes at the end so it doesn't disrupt the flow of the of the reading. But well, you know, there are only two ways that attribute does it. That's a footnote or an endnote, and both of them have their bad points, their good and bad points. But yeah, yeah. Because you, at some point, if you want to know, you have to go to the back of the page. If it's in the back, if it's at the bottom, I mean, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I read a, um, uh, oh God, it was a tetralogy of the Peloponnesian War by this really great uh, professor from Yale called Kagan, and Donald Kagan. This is amazing. Um, Amazing, I agree. But have you read them? Yes. And, and and some of the you could tell I was out of my depth. I was reading this as a college freshman. It was obvious that um, the book was designed for postgraduate level readers who knew Greek because uh, half of the footnotes were in Greek and yeah, uh, and and they took up more than half the page sometimes the footnotes because he would say you know in his body of his text he would say and uh factoria you know um happened and the spartans were cornered and they didn't have any water and of course thucydides says blah, 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 you know and then that's in so, you know in a language that i don't read so that was really interesting you know i mean but um 
Yeah. You know, I, really, I really dislike that. Yeah. I, I mean, first of all, it, it really narrows your audience. Yeah. Well, really. I think it was for a narrow audience. Yeah. yeah. Must have been very narrow. How yeah. many people speak Greek? I, I don't Greek? know yeah. how many people read this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Damn it was four, it was four books. I don't know how many people got through all four books. I did. I didn't understand everything. But, <laughs> but, no, that, but then he went. Right. I hate it when they people when they pause and throws in foreign words. Well, I, I mean, even German and French, which I am somewhat familiar with. Yeah. But I'm not all familiar with it. When they throw in foreign words and don't tell me what they are. Yeah. In other words, they think they're dumbing down if they do tell me what they are. Well, I, I mean, this was obviously something he had to write for some reason and then it had to publish it. But then later he went on and wrote a single volume popular, you know, for popular consumption or more popular consumption, because how many people read about the Peloponnesian War anymore? But but uh, but that it used took to be a while like, ago. Well, that used to be really big when we were in a bipolar like world where it was like Soviet Russia versus the United States. You know, we looked at a lot of different conflicts like the Second Punic War and we looked at the Peloponnesian War and we tried to model our, our world out on that and see what happened in the past to see if we could get some clues. So like, you know, history repeats itself, sort of, so we could get ideas on, on how do you live in that kind of environment and survive and both civilizations survive because that's not what usually happens. Usually one civilization doesn't survive, you know? Well, yeah. I, I got us way off topic. So yeah, you did. after that, you want to, so, so. Yeah, we have a cover letter and a proposal, right? A proposal, right. And this is, this could be, let's say 20 pages. It could be three pages, 20 pages, you know, depending upon how, how detailed you make the proposal. Right. Then you got to send off that cover letter and proposal to the, to the publisher who might be interested in the topic. You got to go back to Google or the library, used to be the library, and you look under for under uh, publishers self-help or publishers history, publishers for the Polynesian War. Okay. okay. So and and then you decide you have to find out who the acquisition editor is, and and get their email and their U.S. mail. And a lot of a lot of publishers won't accept email. Sometimes we will, sometimes they will, sometimes they won't accept U.S. mail. So, so there, there used to be a, a, vo a book, a volume called The Writer's Market, and it would have that kind of information in there. And yes, a sir. lot of times it would say, no unsolicited manuscripts, okay? That's right. So, so that's where an agent comes in, right? An agent is a good thing, but that's, you, you're running to the same thing there, no unsolicited manuscripts. So the it agent is. won't take unsolicited manuscripts. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the value of an agent? Or how, I mean, do you need an agent or? You don't need an agent anymore. You don't. You're used to, but you don't anymore. I see. Uh, you could go directly to the publisher. Okay. But you got to find the right person to send it to in the publisher. I see. Okay. And the best way to do that is look at their personnel. If, if, you, if somebody sends it to me and I'm not the right person, I'm not usually, the, I'm not going to go, oh, here, you know, give it to them. You have to send it directly to that right person in order to guarantee that anybody's going to look at it. That's right. You've got to get it to the right person. <laughs> and that's the acquisition er editor. Well, yeah, the acquisition editor in a small publisher, there's only one. Okay. And then, then, then there are acquisition editors. You know, there are lots of acquisition editors and some, somebody, something, I'm guessing now, but Simon and Schuster probably has a dozen acquisition editor. You know, fiction, nonfiction, self-help, how to commit suicide, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, they have special acquisition editors. Others, others have one acquisition editor and he gets a submission, takes a quick 30 second look at it and sends it off to Joe Blow and say, what do you think? Now I'm the only acquisition editor of the Expression Press. So you know, do excuse me. So you don't send it to anybody. No. So when you read that, you're the final. You're the, the buck stops here, as it were, right? So now, I, I say yeah, your day, right there. Uh, uh huh. But I can no, I take it back. I can be undecided. But the book that I got yesterday, nay. I mean, it didn't take me more than twenty minutes to say no. Gotcha. The content was thin, skinny, trite, and the writing was awful. 
and it had been done before. Why. And it had been done before too, right? Oh, well, yeah, that's what I would say, trite. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess. A, a yeah. Copycat. And uh, but the writing was awful too. It was just, oh. it, 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 it didn't have anything going for it. So I sent it back. Gotcha. On the other hand, about maybe three weeks ago, I got a a uh, a book. The, the guy had already made a book uh, by going to King Co. And it was it's a fiction, but he sent it to me thinking that maybe I could put it on my website, maybe edit it a bit, and then publish it okay, myself in a different form. And it was sent to me at the request of a mutual friend. And I couldn't put it down. Oh, nice. I mean, it was it was fantastically done. Uh, I mean, the story was great. The great dramatic art, great foreshadowing, great character development. I just literally couldn't put it down. I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and start reading it again. Wow. But it needed, it needed a good copy of it. The guy's handling of commas and semicolons was just awful. Yeah. It needed a good copy of it. Yeah. So I'm supposed to talk to him again this week and see where we want to go. To tell me that it would make a great movie. Yeah. So here we go. I, be in, I may be in the fiction business. <clears throat> anyway, once you get the, the cover letter and the proposal written, okay, you have to send it to a publisher. Now, there are several kinds of publishers that you have to decide what you want to do here. A traditional publisher might take a look at that, and if they like it, they will create a book and advertise it for you and take a big chunk of the royalties. Right. right? And uh, you will become either famous and rich or neither. <laughs> and uh, one or the other. And, All right. So, but so they will take a year or more to do that. So realistically, just for people out there, especially younger people that are aspiring writers, maybe older people that are retired in writing or people that wrote a book, you know, over the last year, um, what, how slim are your chances of being famous or rich as a writer? You can't even, you can't even see it. They're like, they're infinitesimal, right? I mean, they're, yeah, you're infinitesimal. Yeah. There's just, there are, the last time I checked, which was only three, four years ago, there are 3 million people in the world who call themselves writers, uh -huh. professional writers. Uh -huh. I am in the top 15%. Good for you. No. You know, people always say that. But that means that 450,000 writers are ahead of me. 450,000. Okay. So there's a lot of writers. There are a lot of writers out there. Yeah. I'm getting to, more and more every minute. I used to say college, everybody and their grandma is a writer. And uh, it's, it's true to an extent. But here's the thing. There are a lot of people that call themselves writers. And they maybe they do write, maybe they write, but they don't finish, right? So they never. Well, we, these are supposedly, these are supposedly people who write and get and get paid for. It. Okay, gotcha. So these are people that have been paid professionally at least once. Yeah. Gotcha, or maybe on a regular basis. Gotcha, but well, that's. I'm sure, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who call themselves writers who don't get paid for it. Well, there's like that. This guy who gave me the book yesterday. I don't know who's going to pay him for that. Right. And I don't think he's written anything else. So but he thing, probably called himself a writer. Sure. He also, he also manages a, a half a dozen pizza huts. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, that's not easy. Um, that would actually make an interesting, that may, there may be some interesting stories there um, about pizzas, pizza delivery. But the, um, the I can't think so. I'm off topic. What was I going to say? Oh. Well, that, well that, let's go back. You know, yeah, we have that, the traditional publisher does oh, right mm -hmm. okay. now we have what they call the vanity publisher and you send them a manuscript and there's one writing in downtown pittsburgh called dorance d-o-r-r-a-n-c-e -E. i've heard of it and uh, they will take your manuscript and they claim that they will edit it and then publish it okay but uh, my experience and experience of other people that abuse it and this is not peculiar to dorance they do damn little editing and they just take your manuscript pretty much as it is and uh, make a book out of it. 
and then they'll list it in their catalog and hope that somebody buys it. But they're going to charge you. Let's say you want 10,000 books. You want to put your inventory. They don't keep an inventory. You keep it. You know, and, they'll, and they'll charge you for 10,000 books. And you put it in your garage. Hmm. Now, that listing in your catalog probably is not going to sell any books to speak of. Mm -hmm. But you think it's done. And you can say to your friends, wow, look at me. I have these 10,000. I have yeah, written these books. Pass them out to your friends and your family. And good. say, here's my book. So, yeah. so that's one way to do it. I mean, but when they're talking about editing, though, they're not talking about the copy editing that you were talking about. They're talking about layout and format, probably. Mostly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have a, a retired uh, friend who's a retired English teacher. In fact, I'm supposed to interview her tonight, but I think we're going to do it another time. She, um, so she'll be, I'll, 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 ma I'll make sure I link that here. But she is amazing. I mean, she, she can't read anything, a newspaper, a blog, an online article without correcting it. Like that's just the way she is. She just, and she knows all the rules. She reads style books yeah. for fun. Like she enjoys that. So like, that's just the way her brain works. You know, she does crossword puzzles. She has a very analytical and she loves language. So that's the kind of person you need to cop, you know, you're looking, they're looking for, maybe they're looking for syntax, but mostly they're looking for punctuational errors and things yeah. of that nature. I do the same thing, Pat. I can't read anything without trying to correct it, which makes me, that takes me probably half as, twice as long to read a novel. Right. I would have done it differently. It always comes into my head. I yeah. would have made this sentence differently. Yeah. I, would, I wouldn't have put this in passive voice. I would have put it in active. I do yeah, it you all read it. You read it as a writer or an editor. Yeah. I yeah. do all the time. Everything. Billboards. I used to laugh and said, I, I edit billboards. <laughs> so, and I do. Billboards I, and headlines. I know a couple of guys who work at the Post Gazette, and headlines are tough. Like, you know, but if you're good at them, you'll get people to read that article. Yeah, and you know, right. how do you get somebody's interest in three or four words? That's poetry. There's an art to that, you know? And the, and the crazy thing about it is the headline doesn't have to have anything to do with the body copy. You check that out sometime. <laughs> as long as you get somebody to read, right? As long as you get somebody to read. That's yeah. the point of the headline is to get, get, get them somebody's to attention. Yeah. That's right. No, that's right. I used to teach in my classes. You don't write a headline that says potatoes are good for you and then write the body and, tr and how turnips are wonderful. Right, right. Yeah. But that's, well, it happens a lot. On YouTube, they call it clickbait. So people will um, will make an, a sensational claim in their, in their title of their video, just so people will click on the video. And then yeah. once they're watching the video, the tendency is they'll stay watching the video. They so watch it, yeah. They call that clickbait. So what's the third way that you were talking about? To well, we have, we have a hybrid hybrid uh, publishers like me, you know, the expressive press. We have 30 books on our, on the website, roughly. We've got four more coming out this year. Uh, so you do about I, four a year. Huh? You do maybe four a year. Yeah, I don't do too many. You know, three, four, five a year, that's tops. Got gotcha. four coming out this year. Already had one, and now we're going to have some more. And the and name you're publishing, out, your publishing firm is? The, What's my that? publishing firm is The Expressive Press. The, the Expressive. The, oh, The Expressive Press. Yeah, dot com. We'll, uh, make sure I, I link that down below. Okay. So the hybrid way is what yeah. you guys do. I will very often uh, grab a manuscript if I like it, and I think I can make money on it, if I can sell it. I will act as a traditional publisher. I will edit it, make it into a book, set it up on my website, set it up on my list, push it on Amazon, get ads on Amazon, ask people for reviews, do all the things that a traditional publisher is supposed to do. And, it, and by that time, the writer has not spent a dime, but I have to have faith in the book. Yeah, it has to be a good I, If I have not, if I don't have faith in the book, I will read it again carefully and say, uh, okay, I will pick up half the cost of producing the book hmm. or, I, or I'll ask you, the author, to pick up the entire cost of, of picking up the book. What would that cost be 
like I know it probably varies, but what what would what would you say? Is it in the thousands of dollars? Is it in the tens of thousands of dollars? What to make a book? Huh? Yeah. To, to, to design it, form, to yeah. format it, design it, make it look yeah. like a book. Well, let's say you read my book and you're like, well, you know, I'll do this for you, but I'm not going to lay out any money. How much am I paying out of pocket? Well, you know, that depends on the size, of course, and the, and the number of visuals, all kinds of things. The, uh, the George Ferris book that we talked about last time. Sure. That was, that was $2,000. Okay. That, that was one of the, that was inexpensive for that book. I could see somebody laying out two grand to get their book like published and promoted on Amazon. Sure, I could see that. The Peach book uh, on the on my website, on my in my press, was more like four thousand. Okay. There was a lot of lot of stuff that you had to get. So let's take the other extreme and say like you find a book and you really like it and you think I'm going to promote this and you put four thousand dollars behind it. What, what kind of return on investment do you get? I mean, are you, do you usually, I mean, I know it varies, of course, but like in order for you to be confident enough, are you expecting a 100% return, a 400% return, a 5,000% return? I tell you the truth, Barry, we're not, we're not a very well-run business. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad you admit it. <laughs> um, we... We expect a return, yes, but we don't. We don't really know how much. It's too heavy. Now, Barry Barry Wolf's book about human resources management. We we didn't think that was going to sell at all, but we probably have a five hundred percent return. Okay, we had to do very little. He's he's a good writer. We had to do very little to create to make it into a book. We had to do very little design for the cover. It's very simple but catchy, and. Barry did all the other work, and Barry did a great deal of, of promoting through his own Facebook and other social media. So we have a big return. You know, he hasn't gotten a return yet because he's gotten a little bit of return, but we have he hasn't gotten a big return yet because uh, the Express and Press spent thousands of dollars advertising him on Amazon and getting people to you know, getting people to write reviews. Mm. And we're still doing that because it's a big sell around the world. Australia, Japan, and Great Britain are big, big markets for us. For that. So for the writer, you, you need fame first, then you get fortune. So like there's no <laughs> chance, it doesn't happen in reverse, right? Most books today uh, in our self-help genre are written as the basis for consulting business. Books are the basis for lectures, classes, seminars, ah. running into colleges and saying, here's my book. Can I talk to your students? Can I that? see. So it's like a companion book or it's a, um, a like something to a credential for your resume. It's a credential for your resume. I see. I have two for my classes. Got you. I have two books, The Power of Writing Well, The Power of Being Articulate, excuse me, yeah, and The Power of Writing Well, and they come together. They tell us it's companion books. So that gives somebody an idea of what you're going to talk about when you like give a lecture. So at least they know that you're serious enough that you had written a book. So you're not just some guy that's going to get up on a podium and start saying stuff without having had researched it enough to like publish a few books. Sure. I could see where that would be helpful. Absolutely. Well, I use my textbooks, those two books, uh, in my classes now with the architecture firm that I teach. And also when I was teaching at, at Duquesne University and at, and at Carnegie Mellon. Nice. Those, those were our textbooks because I wrote them specifically for the engineering construction consulting business. I see. You know, I'm not going to teach you how to how to write the great American novel. My, my writing book don't do that. They teach you how to write nonfiction. Right. And business, business stuff. You want to write a memo, a letter, a proposal, a report? This will give you a heck of a good basis for doing gotcha. it. Gotcha. Very nice. All right. Very, 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 very focused, if you will, on a market. Mm -hmm. But that's my business is very well focused, my lecture business. I get a lot of money for teaching. I get no money for, for selling books. 
matter of fact, for many of my classes, I gave them away. I lectured last year at a group of civil and graduating civil engineers at the University of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And I, ended, I, I, I showed up with a box full of, of textbooks. I gave it, everybody got one. And, oh. and so that when I was lecturing, and I was, we're talking about a two or three hour lecture. When I was lecturing, I could say, I, I expand on this point on page 33 of your book. Let's look at it. And everybody can go to the book, page 33 nice. of your book, and go from there. Okay. So the, the, the books are the basis for my other businesses. And many people have done that. So in and of itself, publishing a book does not necessarily mean you're going to make any money. But it may lead to other opportunities which could make you money. Yes. Yes. That's very nice. Yeah. All the consultants, the self-help consultants like Tony Robbins and uh, what I can name me a few others, they have written books, usually half a dozen of them at least. Sure. And they make they make their money, they make their money lecturing. They charge a heck of a lot of money for the lecture. But also they have a pile of books there. So that if you want to buy one, you can buy one right there. Yeah, but if you're paying ten thousand dollars to go see Tony Robbins, like what's another fifty bucks for a book that he's going to autograph? You know, yeah, exactly. The book is peanuts. I mean, you could use it as an you know anchor on your yacht. You can use it as ballast. <laughs> so, I like. It. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, those are, those are, Tony's are, a great rags to riches story. What's that? Tony Robbins is a great rags to riches story. The way he oh, yeah, it. he is. But yeah. those are the three kinds of publishers, if you want, if I can simplify it. Gotcha. Now, most, many people are just taking it down to the local King Kinko place and see, or they say, here, make me a book. Yeah. King Kinko guys will design you a simple cover and then they and turn your Word document into a book. So what and, about Amazon? What about self-publishing on Amazon? Um, you got me stuck there. Uh, I think they did that at one time, but I'm not too sure they're doing that anymore. That's how I did mine. You did, yeah. Yeah, you, you upload the document and then um, you can design a cover. Um, and uh, they, I don't remember if they provide editing services at, co at, at a cost or, or not. Um, I had my friend, you know, do the copy editing and then, uh, and then they'll print on demand. So, um, so either they'll mostly, it's mostly Kindle downloads. <clears throat> and then if somebody actually wants a hard copy, they'll print one out and you can determine the price um, for within reason. I mean, you can, there's the, 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 the lowest price is determined by what it costs them to make it or what margin they want to make it. <clears throat> but they suggest actually to new writers that you charge as little as possible because you want to get your name out there, right? You, you're not going to make money off your first book probably. And uh, not a lot, <clears throat> but, um, but it's interesting and you can get out there. Um, you know, I'll link my novel down below, but um, you know, I, a couple of people buy it a month. It's not, it's not like I'm not making that much. I'm not making any money off it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. But you but don't least, write a book now to make money. But at least it's out there and it's not sitting in my drawer anymore. Like and it was for the last 29 years when I, you know. <laughs> you can point at it and say, look at me. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I could do that. Um, but um, I very often cost, call my, my Express and Press, my company, mm -hmm. um, my end of life ego trip. Yeah. So, uh, but I... I'm, well, not, I'm not making him. By the way, I just got my tax and I'm on my tax form yesterday. Yeah. And I asked my accountant, I said, How much did I lose on the Express and Press? He said, Oh, about the same thing you lost before last 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 year. It was about five thousand yeah. dollars. So I lost five thousand dollars last year on the Express and Press. So you don't make any money off of this. Even well, with even even with a very popular book on the list. Yeah. But I make a hell of a lot of money teaching because I have two books on the Express and Press. And that supports other books on the Express and Press. The book that I'm finishing up now, I'm tweaking it now. I don't expect to make any money on it. Yeah. Yeah. I've had four reviews, four you know, independent reviewers. They love it. Okay. I was concerned 
that I was really wasting my time writing it. And I told them all, I said, I'm not too sure this book has any value at all. Yeah. But they loved it. <laughs> this is your very own book. So, so here's the thing with independent reviewers. Now, do you pay them for their time? Uh, I don't because my independent reviewers are former top executives that I knew when I was in business. So they're doing it as a favor. But if somebody else exactly. wants to review, are they going to pay for it? So what's to prevent? I mean, if if I'm being paid by somebody to review a book, I'm going to give it a favorable review, right? Yes. So so when you read the back of like a Stephen King novel and it says, this is the best novel ever written in the history of mankind, you know, like that's all like paid nonsense. It's paid nonsense. Right? <laughs> I'm just jo I'm joking, but like I mean, really? There, there's an outfit called Kinkus Reviews, and they have you know, probably thousands of people who review books. Yeah, okay? and you can pay them one hundred dollars a review, and I've done that. Yeah, and uh, theoretically they're objective. Yeah, and uh, but I've never gotten. I probably have done that with at least four or five books. And I've never gotten a bad review. Yeah. Never. <laughs> they take that hundred bucks and, and write something beautifully flowery, wonderful. That might be fun. So if you're a writer and you're and you like to read books, that might be a way to go too. You might be a review writer. Sure. You Especially if you like to give compliments. <laughs> and that, lie. That could be interesting. And well, well you know, yeah. the one we'll I got yesterday. We'll call it, yeah, we won't call it lying, but you know. What, what do we call it? Uh, let's call it um, um, stressing the truth. Creative. Um, creative bullshit. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. But the one I got yesterday, literally, you know, I got this through a mutual friend. And she, yeah. was, she was in the house this morning. You know, we were talking about the book. And I, I wrote a one page critique of it. None of it any good. I was trying to be soft, but the reviews were not good. Yeah. And she said, well, what am I going to, what am I going to tell my friend, the author? Oh. Okay. Well, I told her, I told her point blank, you must tell that author the truth or you lose your integrity. Yes. Right. And yes. if you want to lose your integrity and you can bullshit, you know, just polish it up. You know, polish up the reviews if you want to. But if I were you, and I wanted to keep sort of like I look myself in the mirror the next day, I would take my one page critique and I would give it to the author and say, an acquisition editor of a publishing company won't get about your book. I there see. you go. Yeah. There so you go. Blame, blame it on me. For some distance between the bad news and, and your friendship, because this happened to me ugh, multiple times, but I, I remember one in particular where a guy found out that I, you know, had a writing major and said, hey, will you read my manuscript? And I read it and it was terrible. And I told him where I told him where it was terrible. And I told him how I thought he might be able to improve it. And I told him why. And um, and he did a vanity publishing thing. He, he was not, you know, he wasn't a writer, um, but but I, I told him. I admire the fact that you were able to take the time to do this. So if you take a little more time, you're going to be able to improve this by 50%. You're, yeah. You know, just, just, you know, and, and keep getting people to give you honest opinions. And he was yeah. a customer of my customer of mine at the, at the restaurant. Oh. And after that, mm -hmm. I never saw him again. I, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. His ego was attached to that manuscript so much. That must have been the novel that he had been trying to write ever since he read Isaac Asimov when he was 10 years old. It was a sci-fi book and, and it, was, it had some good ideas, but they were all stolen. They were all other people's ideas that he had mishmashed into an amalgamation of his own. And, and it could have been a new concept, but it wasn't developed yet. So it was a first draft and he thought it was done. And, um, and it was a shame. But, um, well, that brings us back to the idea that writers definitely have to have thick skins. Yeah. You have to be able to, to be able to accept realistic criticism. You have to. When I first started to write 40 years ago, 50 years ago, I was something like, yeah, 50 years ago, now, can you believe it? 
I was scared to death to sit across the desk from a critiquer, my customers. I was writing speeches and things like that for executives at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was scared to death. It took me probably three months to get over that because mm -hmm. I finally realized that I know more about it than they do. Yeah. So, but you're yeah. giving them, if you're writing a speech for somebody, that's their product. So at the end, they, they get the final say. But, so you're basically, you're a technician. You know, you're like, okay, what do you want? You want to portray an image? Do you want to convey facts? Do you want to, you know, what are we doing here first? And then, and then you, and you work with that. But um, the thing with writing that you, you brought up with it, I find is interesting. It's there's, you have to have almost a split personality because you have to be, you have to be egotistical. I mean, egotistical is not a, a great word. You have to have enough of an ego to think that you have something to say that other people want to hear, right? Otherwise, why write at all? And and yet you have to be humble enough to accept criticism without getting your soul crushed, you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, it's a tough game, you know? It really is. It's a tough game, but. Yeah, it is. I got to tell you this story. And not, everything, not everybody's going to like everything. So like, you I know, know you, you might've written the best sci-fi novel ever, ever, but if I don't like sci-fi, that's, that's, you know, that doesn't work. But tell me your story. I want to hear your story. Well, I, got, I have two, if I can remember them both. Anyway, I was I wrote about maybe 25 speeches for a big executive, for a big meeting of executives, you know, 250 executives. Okay. Anyway, one guy, one of the top guys in his company, this is a this is multi-billion dollar company, right? Mm. And he gave up and he gave a speech and he got wild applause, blah, 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 blah. One guy called, grabbed me at the end. He knew who I, why I was there. He grabbed me and he said, you must've written Harry's speech. And I said, well, you know, I'm not supposed to say that. But, you know, if you pick that up, that's okay with me. Mm. And, he, and I, he said, how did you know that? And he said, well, it made sense. So I know he didn't do it himself. <laughs> <laughs> so. Hey, <laughs> at least that CEO or whoever that executive was, was, smart enough to know that he needed help right that's 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 how i made my career well, that's people were smart enough to know that they couldn't write properly themselves and it took them far too long and their productivity depended on me and it was perfect it that's was a good perfect. ceo i've met perfect a few win-win situation i've met a few ceos and a good ceo knows how to play to his strengths and delegate his weaknesses to Thank people you. who are strong in that area. That is the key. And Thank and I mean, I'm sure that's in management 101, but like, why don't people do that? You know, they tr some people try to do everything themselves because they think that they're, they're, own, they're the only ones that can do it best. And then, and after a company gets so big, you can't do that anymore. You have to have, you have to accept help and you have to realize the there's people, gonna be human error. People who think they can do everything themselves are the ultimate in arrogance. Yes. And, uh, you know, arrogance can get you in nothing but trouble, but I've written thousands of words about that. Yeah. But the other story I have to tell you is that another executive, great guy, I love him, you're a good golf partner. Uh, he insisted that of all paragraph, a couple minutes of the speech that I wrote for him, he didn't like. So he wrote it himself. And there he was in the middle of the speech. And here comes this. 30, maybe, maybe 60, 80 seconds of his writing. And his style is so much clumsier than mine yeah. that we were at rehearsal and he was reading a speech and he came to that and he stopped and he waved his papers. I guess. And I was in the audience, we were rehearsing, right? He said, he said, Pete, who wrote this crap? And I said, you did. <laughs> that's your part. I said, that's, that's the only part of that speech that you wrote. And he looked at it and he said, yeah, you're right. Can you rewrite it? <laughs> and I said, sure. Well, so, that takes humility. Yeah, it does. That, that takes humility. Good. Good. I, that's something I learned in my, one of my senior seminars in fiction was that we would read each other's work out loud. So there were seven or eight of us and uh, 
and you did not read your own work, you let somebody else read it. And that's when you saw the mistakes. You could see where people were fumbling over the language. You could write, and you had time to write notes as a, someone else was reading it aloud. And it's so, I think it's so important. I mean, obviously speeches, but, but anything really, try reading it aloud and you will find errors, you know? And, and, and when things are well-written, I mean, especially fiction, um, but also I took some poetry too. So you will find that there are words, you know, the English language can be beautiful, yes. but you have to work at it. It's not French, it's not Italian, not everything rhymes at the end of the sentence. It doesn't have that lyric-y sing-song um, feeling naturally, but you can make it happen in moments if you really work at it, but you have to read it out loud. Um, it's so much easier to spot mistakes if you read them out loud, I think. For me, well, there are, I, have, I have two quality checks. Um, when you, you know, seeing as writing is a process where we're making something, it's a manufacturing process if you want to look at it that way. I have two quality checks and one is to read it out loud in your, to yourself. And people say to me, well, I can't read it out loud on my desk. And I say, well, go out to your car. You know, yeah. Read it out loud in your car. And when you stumble, you know you got a problem. Do something. Yeah. Yeah. Circle it. Yeah. That's one, one quality check. The other one is, for yeah. many people, is to pin your document on the wall and stand back. Even if you have to stand back so far, you need operators to read it because it gives you distance from your words. Sounds corny, doesn't it? But I know people who've done that. For that. Huh? I've never done that. It's, it, it works beautifully for some people. Interesting. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. try that. I have a bunch of billboards that I bought to put ideas on and kind of like flow chart kind of patterns. But um, put your document on there. Yeah. And read it. You don't have to read it out loud that way. But I know one guy who actually uses opera glasses. He, he has to get far enough away. So he has to use opera glasses to read his documents. Well, that's awesome because now I can go out and buy some opera glasses, which I've always <laughs> wanted to have some. Okay. Well, you don't have to. Just just walk around. No, opera glasses are cool. I definitely want those. That's like now I take to wearing gloves because I, I don't want to use hand sanitizer all the time when I go into stores and things. So I wear gloves. And then when I go back to my car, I take the gloves off. My hands are still germ free, theoretically. I love wearing gloves. I've always wanted to wear gloves in public. And now I get to. It's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the women in the back of not too long ago wore gloves as a, as a fashion thing. They did, but it's it was impossible for men to do so. But now it's not, which I think is awesome. So. Well, back a long time ago, they did. They you did know, a long wore, time ago. Men wore gray gloves with their black suits. Sure. If you were gold suits were black. Jane Eyre. Yeah. And then when somebody insulted them, they pulled off their gloves and snapped your question sheet. That's exactly <laughs> why I want them. And uh, in fact, I have some leather gauntlets here that would make great, like slap across the face, like. Yeah, you know. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Would get hurt if you slapped them with that. So. Well, well, anyway, I challenge you to a duel. I guess. Well, can I tell you anything more about publishing? No, but if you ever want to fence, I, I I know how to fence, so we could do some dueling sometimes. So <laughs> uh, I think that's all I got. Uh, if. If anybody has a question, put it in the comments below and then we'll, maybe we'll do a follow up. Uh, but this has been a great talk. I appreciate your time, Pete, and your wealth of knowledge as always. And I always like talking to you. We always have fun, enjoy. Yeah, yeah enjoy good it. time. Yeah, good. Do you have anything you want to add? I don't think so. All right. Well, all right. Let, so, I, I guess we could just say if anybody out there is listening and has a great book, you know, let me know. Pete's always looking for a good book. So we're going to put the contact information to uh, the Express, the Expressive Press down below. And uh, to the audience, uh, smash like for me because that helps me. And um, see if you can do something nice for somebody today without getting caught. Okay, I'm going to, okay. Stop. I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.